Hello, I'm Scott Clover, and you're listening to the Intuitive Energy Podcast. This podcast series is about intuition, healing, and creating new energetic patterns that benefit you in your daily life. In my private practice, I help people heal from a diverse range of issues, including self-acceptance, trauma release, managing anxiety, emboldening self-worth, and creative expression. In today's episode, we discuss the importance of being grounded, energy and how it differs from dogma, how childhood defense mechanisms can hinder us later in life, and the importance of free will. Enjoy! This is Carl Munson in conversation with Scott Plover, who is an intuitive energy healer. And we'll be looking at Scott's approach and his ideas about energy healing, power of intuition, and how to live in an unblocked and vibrant way. Hi, Scott. Hi, how are you? I'm very well. And in large part, thanks to you, because we've been doing a bit of work together and I've really enjoyed it. And I do feel unblocked, but maybe more about that later on when we talk about energy healing and blockages and getting unblocked and all of that and how it works on people. Something very interesting that uh, we, were, we were talking about recently was how you're favoring not kind of putting yourself in a whole kind of new agey movement, but being in a different place, like having what, what we might call mainstream people, opening their minds to the sort of work you do. Is that a fair assessment? Yeah, I would say that's a fair assessment. My work is also designed in to get people to feel more comfortable in their bodies. Yeah. So when you're more comfortable in your body, then your intuition works better, your body works better, you're residing in where you live, as opposed to living outside the, the physical form that's carrying you around. And I think a lot of times in what's considered the new age movement or the spiritual movement, a lot of the focus is on up, 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 perceive more, understand more, see more, and open up my third eye. And those things are all wonderful. But yeah. if you're not balancing it in the body, if you're not grounding the body, then the insights you're having might not be metabolized correctly. You might not be able to utilize even a third of the information or a fraction of the information that you're receiving because it's going into an unfiltered zone or an ungrounded zone. So part of what I like to do is help people expand their intuition, but at the same time understand that if they ground it in their bodies, then that's a lot more important and uh, effective going forward. Excellent. Okay. So I get that. I mean, I, I, I have um, had my skirmishes and, and immersion in the new age scene and there's all the kind of spiritual bypassing, how people can use it as a way of avoiding arguably a more sort of grounded and practical reality of life. And you want to get to where people are on an everyday basis, by the sound of it, not the kind of retreat territory, not as a way of getting out of the existence, but a way of helping people who are really living life such as we live it in these, and let's face it, they're kind of turbulent times, aren't they? Is that part of what you're thinking is that, you know, this is a, this is a time where it's really needed as well, because people are a little bit bereft of ideas about how to live their lives fully and healthily and freely. Well, you Correct. And, you know, before growing up in previous decades, there was almost in, in a believed support system that would happen, whether your company was going to take care of you in old age or your pension was going to take care of you in old age or uh, Social Security here in America. Um, in Europe, you're taken care of more on a, a socialist viewpoint. But when we look here in America specifically out our society is not protecting us. Our government is no longer protecting us in the food and water that we eat or thinking that the individual is important. So I would like people to understand that their individuality is important and what they have and what they, how they interact with the world is important. And from there, it will create maybe down in the future, a different way of looking at society or structures in general. The one thing I try to steer clear of in my work is, is sort of dogma or an approach that energy is happening on behalf of the request of something else. What I mean by that is I perceive energy as moving or not moving, functioning to a purpose or functioning towards sort of a, a negative outcome. I don't perceive it as there is a litany of entities moving it around as if like a godlike structure or the, the way the Greeks used to see the gods because they didn't have words for what was happening you know, the Greeks created gods because lightning happened. The Greeks created God because the sun came out every morning. Mm. We know a lot more about life than, than, so if you perceive these things as just energy moving and in patterns, and you find ways to perceive those patterns, 
then you can understand what's happening more. It's the E word, the energy word is a little bit difficult for people, isn't it? And, and, and within the, the, the mainstream context, it's not like, you know, although we have come a long way since the um, ancient understandings of how the world works and why people created gods, the, the world as it's expressed in a very sophisticated way in the media, like we got it all figured out, still doesn't really talk very much about energy, except, you know, in the form of utilities and, you know, energy as in a, a, a sort of physical scientific thing. But am I right in thinking the energy you're talking about, people can actually understand very directly as, you know, their, their breath or their chi or what, whatever it is that people are beginning to really understand through Tai Chi and yoga, it's life force that's coming through. And it's what we do with that that makes all the difference. Well said. It is life force. And as we now know, because science is proving, the world changes when observed. So the observer has the potential of changing the world at large just by the perception, by being engaging, by engaging with different patterns. So we have a choice how to receive certain patterns in our lives. Sometimes things that seem negative in the moment turn out to be very fortuitous after the fact. I mean, they write country songs about it. Thank God I, you know, sometimes I thank God for unanswered prayers. Well, I don't know how much God had to do with you breaking up with your high school girlfriend so you can find the woman of your dreams in your 30s, right? I don't know if there was someone in charge of that or if your life was just destined to go a certain way if you made certain choices. So there is this, this energy on the move. In the most basic sense, we could, we could see that people are beginning to understand it because it's like it's okay to go to yoga or tai chi or qigong now, isn't it? People are understanding that. Another part of that, would that be energy in the form of other people's, I don't know, like not just their opinions, but I had this thought last night. My, my wife and I, Louisa and I were talking about this, um, I, I have to own up to having a very kind of judgmental and um, superior, like a superiority complex that I'm really embarrassed about. I'm really quite ashamed of. But I can see that it's been my pattern of survival. In the, you know, from being a kid, it, just, it just became useful to sort of look down on my parents, first of all. And then I began to extend that. I mean, I learned it from them, but then I used it on them and I used it on other people to kind of create safety and confidence in myself. And then I've done all sorts of, you know, like we're talking about new agey stuff. I've, I've tried to be a nice new ager as well and be sort of compassionate and all the rest of it to kind of cover that up. But that energy pattern of having a superior, superiority complex, is that the sort of thing you're talking about as well? These, these energies and patterns and inherited things that come from us, come at us actually from our family and our culture. Is that, some, is that energy that we can work with as well? The sort of energy that you work with? Oh, certainly. I, I have this sort of idea that I, that I tell people when we work together of the parachute. The parachute is great as you're falling into your life. Meaning if you get a parachute at five and you fall using that parachute until 20, fantastic. You, you've learned to have safety mechanisms put in place that are going to get you to land safely on the ground. At that point in our 20s and our early 20s, society or someone should have turned us around and said, look behind you. Look at all the stuff you did to get to adulthood. Now forget all that crap. Forget all the things that bothered you and the idiosyncrasies and the, the issues you've had, the interpersonal issues. Let all that go and start over because you're an adult now with a basic sense of right and wrong. But unfortunately, a lot of us, most of us, keep that parachute on when we land at 2021. Well, what would happen if you're walking around a windy town with a parachute on your back? Not good. The wind's going to pick up and, and pull you backwards. So you're going to be fighting the same safety measures that you installed in your adolescence and, and, and young years. Right. And this is a sort of, this is a very thing that you can address in people and help them be clear of or restructure or, or create something new. Correct. Those security measures we put in place to guard our psyches during tumultuous times in our adolescence become in rooted patterns if we don't pay attention to them. And instead of letting them go and starting over, we just add on top of them, which means they still exist at the bottom of the pile, which means they're still affecting us energetically until we go in there and try to clean up some of those childhood impressions. Because what you needed to feel safe at seven is definitely what you don't need to feel safe at 27. It's either right. gonna continue to limit you or it's gonna continue to keep you too open and then you're gonna annoy people. The picture you create for me is that we might have people 
like you say, who are 27, 37, 47, even 77, Correct. still being run by their seven-year-old programs. Now, that is a terrifying proposition because in a world without initiation and in a world without this sort of reprogramming or healing going on, the scale of it just occurs to me as being really awful. And there's like millions, billions of people who, who are being run by their childhood survival strategies, going about the world pretending to be adults. Do you share my sense of horror of the scale of all of that? Mm, I'm not going to give you a sense of horror. I'm going to give you a sense of that's the way it is. And if we want to change it, then now we have the technologies in place to change it. And those technologies start small in whispers in small groups, but those whispers in small groups down the line will create tribes and groups and those groups will help bond together. And then eventually this will become more commonplace. I like that. So thank you for reframing that for me. And that perhaps is also a clue to the power of what we're talking about here, yeah? So me talking in terms of horror and going off on a kind of negative look at it is a, is a, is a powerful thing in itself and, and, and can affect the whole nature of the conversation and our, our communication here. Now so, imagine you talking like that to your inner body. Yes. Oh, God, so your yeah. inner body is getting fear. Your inner body is getting spoken to in contraction. Your inner body is being spoken to in... I have to protect myself against that ideology, as opposed to I have to understand it more. And in that understanding, then it will release inside of me. And if I'm open about it, then maybe what I'm saying will help someone else. Yeah. Right? From an individual perspective. Okay, so I think of it like this. There's memes going around the internet of, you know, this principle of hurt people hurt. Yes. So if you are intimidated as a child, then you're going to either try to intimidate as an adult or remain intimidated. So the idea is to find these patterns in your, in your psyche, in your past lives, in your family, and say, oh, I'm not going to repeat that. If I don't repeat that pattern, then it won't get repeated on to my nieces and nephews or the children that we have in the future. Beautiful, beautiful. Now, I think you said something like the tools are available now like it's a, it's a moment in time and like they're available now or we always had them and then because things have gone in a certain direction, they're more obvious or more needed now. How, how is that working? I think a little bit of everything you just said. Um, you know, up until 20, 30 years ago, we didn't have the luxury of looking inward. True. You know, the, the 60s, the, 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 the free love movement of the 60s was really one of the first times in our cultural histories that we had the opportunity to look inward. Up until the Industrial Revolution, we were too busy trying to defy gravity, meaning finding ways to pick up heavy things without exerting ourselves too much. And then that changed to food production. And then that changed to technology now. And that was all, if you look in the grand scheme of humanness, that was all a, a blink of an eye in our timeline. And just in the last 20, 30 years, has it even been borderline accepted to go to a yoga class, do a meditation, having men get in touch with themselves? That wasn't viable in the 70s. You would have gotten laughed out of your executive meeting. Yes. <laughs> Whereas now you have CEOs going to Burning Man. And you have CEOs, you know, understanding a real sense of tribe or community or compassion. And those things will start to take over because it's affecting, especially here in the United States, the capitalist system. The capitalist system is, is shaking in its boots because it knows it's not uh, long term. So a lot of these companies are turning to a model of let's take care of our employees in different ways than they used to. And those employees are saying, oh, well, now I have a chance or an opportunity to look inside myself. So I am going to take 15 minutes out and meditate. Yeah. And, and so what piece by piece, little by little, these floodgates might begin to open and, and the big picture can change quite dramatically. How, how, how do you see that? How do you, how do you see that manifesting in the big picture? I think that uh, once people get fed up with sort of the way we've been told to medicate ourselves, Mm. that's already the, the veneer is cracking with that. So if you realize that there are technologies now that can help heal your anxiety, as opposed to a pill that will keep it at bay until you stop taking the pill and then the anxiety comes back, 
people are catching on. People don't want to be taking these medications any longer. They want to learn new technologies that will remove the issue or move the issue out of the way so they can f flow a little freer, as it were. Yeah, and this thing of what, being sick and tired of being sick and tired, that's, that's one sign, isn't it, is that you are, or you may be, one might be taking medication to keep something at bay rather than releasing something. What are other signs that people might have? You know, we're talking about people switching on or, or, or opening up to the idea of energy healing. What cusp might they be at? What situation, what signs might they see in their lives that might suggest they're ready to do exactly that? Well, one thing I like to ask people to do is, is uh, what is the intention behind their action? Meaning, if they're feeling limited or contracted about something, how did that contraction start? Where did it come from? Was it a societal pressure, what I call conditioned thinking? Was it something in society that, that deemed it wasn't okay for them to act a certain way, so they limited their behavior? That's an idea that I don't have permission to be myself. Mm. I'm, I was not permitted to be myself, and now I don't have permission, and I keep thinking that. Until the, 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 the day you wake up and you say, oh, you know what? That was conditioned thinking. That was my principal that told me that, or a parent, or somebody in authority that told me that. And I realize now that I have free will and I have permission or I'm giving myself permission to act in accordance to how I feel I should. So that's an idea of permission. The other idea is, are you disallowing yourself from action because of a personal contraction that you're holding? The way I explain this is, uh, there was a movie 30 years ago called Footloose. And I think they remade it a few years back. Yeah. And the idea is that these children lived in a, a community that did not allow dancing. So they were not permitted to dance. So those adults, once they leave that community, have to give themselves permission to dance and then they can go out dancing. So that's the idea of how you can use conditioned thinking against yourself, how conditioned thinking can impact you by not thinking you have permission because society didn't give it to you. If you're like a fourth grader and you're dancing in your music class, and the girl on the other side of the room says, oh, look at Jimmy, he dances funny. And Jimmy gets so self-conscious that he stops dancing. And then he misses all the school dances and then he goes to weddings in his 20s and 30s and doesn't dance at the wedding. He has disallowed himself from dancing because he was self-conscious. Susie didn't tell him, you can't dance, you're not allowed. What she said was, I think you dance funny. And he took it so personally that he never expressed himself in that manner again. Oh God, that's so painful. <laughs> but it happens all the time. It happens, it contracts us all the time. Yeah. That's, a, that's a very major example. People can really relate to that example because people feel self-conscious by self-expressing or dancing sometimes. Yeah. But think of that in terms of any situation you have in your life that you feel you should be more expressed in. Is it because you've limited yourself because you're, you're self-conscious of judgment from others? Or did you really feel that you never had permission to do that and you still don't have permission to do that? That's when you stop and you say, okay, well, let's kind of screw an authority figure here and me decide for myself that I have permission to go out dancing or self-expressing or being an artist or a cellist or you know, something that may not have been accepted in your family. You now have the choice to make and say, that was them, this is me. Wow, and that sense of freedom, okay, and then, so it is really watching your thoughts and, and, a, and an amount of self-observation, which, as you say, has become easier in, in recent times, hasn't it? You know, we were preoccupied with the other, within the other areas of the hierarchy of human needs. Now we've got some space to observe ourselves. When we observe ourselves, we can see the sort of the, sorts of things you were just talking about. And that might be the time to call someone like you up to, to reroute or open up those fixed ways of being yeah because I, I guess yeah the fixed can't... ways of thinking i would say fixed ways of think. thinking the fixed yeah. ways of thinking create the way you are or your state of being yeah and the thing i would tell the person as you said if they came to me i would ask them how is that energy arriving at you is it is that pit in your stomach created is it pulling inward or does it feel like something sitting on you and you're feeling pressure from the outside yeah so if you're having an issue like this, take a moment, take a breath and notice how is that energy impacting me? 
Is it pulling from the inside? Is it pushing from the outside? Which direction is it coming? What color does it feel like? These are all questions I ask in, in my therapy sessions. And these are all the beautiful subtleties of being alive, aren't they? Because the way we've tended to have it is like we just feel well or we don't feel well. And the subtleties of where energy is felt in our bodies has really been marginalized, isn't it? And sidelined. Do you know, do, have, you, have you a guess why that is? Why, why we, we, we're not very sophisticated in the reading of our own bodies? Why, why have we learned to do that culturally? So I, I think the natural instinct is if you walk by a stinky pile of garbage, you're not going to walk right next to it if you can choose to. You're going to walk around it. You're not going to get anywhere near that stinky pile of garbage because you don't want to smell it, right? Yeah. And then you're going to keep walking. It's going to be behind you and then you're going to forget about it. Well, if something hurts in your body or there's a pain in your body, we were sort of told earlier, just implied that, oh, don't go anywhere near that. If you uh -huh. have hip pain, then try to ignore it. And the flip side of that is, oh, if you have a hip pain, go inside the pain. Where's the epicenter? What is the sensation? Is it prickly? Is it warm? Is it spiky? And, and ask yourself, how are these things happening as opposed to, oh, I don't like that, so I'm going to avoid it. Mm. Well, that's like live, an empty house is, becomes dilapidated because it doesn't have the, the life force of the energy of the family living in it. So if you're ignoring a hurt or sore part of your body by not trying to be insightful to it, it's going to fester and get worse because it's being ignored. And you're doing it on purpose, but maybe not intentionally. Yeah, and, and I'd like to flip that on its ear and say, oh, there's a pain in your knee or a pain in your hip. Go into that pain. Well, how is it speaking to you? What is it saying? Does it have a story? If it has a story, can you let that story go? And if you need help with these kinds of questions, then people come and see somebody like me because I have sort of an insight into this more specific or a specificity about certain energy contractions. But there is potential for people to look and feel inside themselves, ask questions and get real answers. And then able to receive sort of like an energetic antidote or a color mm -hmm. or a vibration that you can send into that part of your body that's going to shake things up and create maybe a healing environment as opposed to a environment that is unhealthy. Yeah. And there's so much information there, isn't there, that might be ignored or might have been carried for decades. And it's such rich information. Just something that's occurred to me to ask you is in the company of people who, you know, someone who's self-expressed and, and gone through some of this healing work, and if they're standing in front of you and then you're standing next to, you know, like a very traditional man who's like, you know, that David Byrne song, hard men, hard lives, hard keeping it all inside. Do you get a sense of those people energetically? Of what, can, can, can you, are you feeling that when, when you're en encountered by those two types of people? Um, I would say I feel that more in session. I try not to keep my satellite dish open when I interact with people on you know, in a daily life situation on the street, in the store, at a dinner party. Yeah. I try to reserve delving too far into people's energy fields unless it's, it's in the sort of the clinical or, or my work. Um, it's too much information for me to receive otherwise. Yeah. Yes. But to answer your question, if someone is sitting with me um, and we work on it together, yes, there are reasons behind machismo there are reasons behind docileness and those those two ends of that spectrum happen with both genders yeah so they're either you know too much of a go-getter or not a go-getter at all yeah. and and that may be contradictory to how they really feel inside but they've had those contractions i spoke about earlier or those those implications or the the dents in their energy field and they've just never taken the time to buff the buffer those dents out yeah okay amazing so one last question uh, this is sort of projecting it out into the future metaphorically but you know we're talking here about how, how we've had this progression over the last few decades from an opening up you know the 60s and then the new age movement as it's occurred to us and it had, had its impact on society in recent decades and how it is now that it's very likely that you'll be able to work with people who you know aren't new agey who are just 
mainstream everyday folks, but who can really understand now what you're, what we've just talked about to work with you. Yeah, so. I'm not new agey. I don't consider myself new agey or spiritual. Do I uh, burn things in my practice uh, in terms of sage or, or Palo Santo? Yes, because that has a function. Yeah. Using things like that is a function to help clear energy. Is that a new age practice? It's also a new age practice, but it's rooted in, in shifting the energy in the room. Yeah. So when I think of things as energy, it really allows the dogma to dissipate. And the intentions, the, the best of intentions of others to create dogma around energy practices, that they had the best intentions to do it. But that made someone feel better. And then it became the ideologies of someone imposed onto somebody else. Yes. And I think it's more important for us to understand that we perceive energies, each one individually. And as we do it individually, we can bind together as the, in a collective to make us feel better that we're doing it. Marvelous. And, and as this collective is progressing into the future and developing, do you think we just, we're going to be collectively more at ease? Because uh, it was fascinating what you were saying there about how, you know, you need to shut your satellite dish down. Oh, I mean, that would be terrible, wouldn't it, to be... And, we, you know, we've seen this depicted in films, haven't we? People who are, are very open psychically, energetically. That it, it can be really hard for them to, to encounter that all the time. But... Would there be a relaxing of that in the future as we're all more open to each other's ease and relaxation and, we, and we've dealt more with our healing? Can you see that? Can you see a sort of relaxation and ease around that so there isn't so, so much of a polarity? I think when we start to understand that a large percentage of what we consider mental illness is actually people being too open to other energy realms, yeah, then the mystique about this will change as well. And the mystique of mental illness will change as well. But you have to realize we with our ears and eyes only perceive 1% of the energetic spectrum. 1%. Wow. Yeah. That means there's 99% of other things happening that we can't physically or register with our eyes and ears. Yeah. So if there's people out there like me or people that are far too open, they're perceiving just a little bit more than that 1%. Yes. They're not perceiving 80%. They're perceiving maybe one and a half percent of the energies that are out there. And it's right for the times and the context for them to do that and to be able to be helpful. But if them. you go to somebody in a, in a secured system we have now that says, I'm seeing or feeling this in an overwhelming fashion, they're going to label you mentally ill. Yeah. And that's technically for the, a lot of these people, that's not what's happening. What's happening is they're too open and we don't have words for it in our society yet. Wow. It's coming but it's, it's not there yet. And a lot of the reasons why these people are so open is because they were traumatized as children. The, a large part of empaths are so empathic because they had their radar up because they were fearful of a, their state of being around them. They were fearful yeah. of a family member or someone in their neighborhood, so their guard was always up. So they, these children are taught or self-taught to be open to the energies around them and it's a protection mechanism. Yeah. Well, when you stay open like that and you get older and there's more energy that you're in involved with or influenced by, and you don't have the skills to say, oh, my protection mechanism as a child was to be overly empathic. And now I'm an overly empathic adult. Society looks down on overly empathic adults. But it was a, it was a safety mechanism you needed because you were experiencing trauma as a child. Wow. And they, this is like the canary in the coal mine analogy, isn't it? Is you know how, how miners used to use a mm -hmm. canary to to check for gas leaks in a in a in a coal mine. People are like that as well, aren't they? In terms of feeling things on our collective behalf, I think. Sure, but it can become overwhelming unless you have the proper skills to shut it down, uh, metabolize it, yeah, let it in 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 ways that aren't caustic to your system. It's not an yeah. overwhelm, an overload. Yeah. But empathic overload is, is very rampant. And I think people listening to this will, will resonate in, and, and hear that and may even be experiencing that. Scott, what's the best way for them to get in touch with you or to find out more about the work you do and, and then people working in the same sort of field? Sure. So my website is my name, scottclover.com. There's testimonials on there about people, different types of people that I've helped along the way. There's certain things in there about my approach. 
they're more than welcome to email me through the website if they have specific questions about their situation. And yeah, I see people in person here in Manhattan and over the phone internationally. So I work with people, I don't know, three or four continents currently. There's several clients I've had over the years that I've never met before because most, a lot of this work is done over the phone. And my perception isn't limited by geography. That's, that's maybe a discussion for another time, how the quantum realm works. But if there's an energy pattern happening, uh, people like myself can perceive it in real time and, and distance or geography is not as important. Okay, excellent to talk to you as usual. And I look forward to talking to you again. So scottclover.com is the place to go. Thanks, Carl. Appreciate it. You've been listening to the Intuitive Energy Podcast with me, Scott Clover. Thanks to Carl Munson for the great discussion and to Corey Tutt for the music you're listening to. In my private practice, I encourage people to heal what holds you back and feel better in your body. If you need more help with that process, I'm available for healing sessions by phone internationally. Visit scottclover.com for more information. Be well, and thanks for listening. This podcast is for educational and informational purposes only and solely as a self-help tool for your own use. I'm not providing medical, psychological, or nutrition therapy advice. You should not use this information to diagnose or treat any health problems or illnesses without consulting your own medical practitioner. Always seek the advice of your own medical practitioner and or mental health provider about your specific health situation. For my full disclaimer, please go to scottclover.com disclaimer.